Hi! Hey! Welcome to The Cordial Catholic, a podcast for non-Catholics, new Catholics, and those looking to dig deeper into the Catholic faith. I'm K. Albert Little, an evangelical, non-denominational convert to Catholicism, and this podcast is born out of one particular idea. It began for me when a Protestant pastor asked me the question, what's more important, the Bible or tradition? That led me into a long journey into the ancient faith. I looked into the history of the biblical canon, the history of the Bible, the early church, the early church fathers, the Reformation, and ended up knocking up against Catholic theology. It was then when I encountered the ancient Catholic church in her own words, in the words of actual Catholic theologians and church fathers, it was then that I realized that what I thought I knew about Catholicism what Catholics believed, was oftentimes based on misinformation and more often than not on simple misunderstandings. Well, this podcast serves to fill in that same gap. The gap between what you think Catholics believe and what we actually do. Each week, I have a real Catholic conversation with a real Catholic thinker from the heart of the Catholic Church. No misinformation here. And this week, I'm joined by two fantastic guests to talk about a fantastic topic. We're talking about the historical, the biblical Mary. And my guests are William Albrecht and Father Christian Kappas. They have a fantastic new book on this exact subject, and, oh guys, it's just a great conversation. We look at who Mary is through the lens of Scripture, what the Bible says about Mary, We let the Bible speak for itself, Scripture speak for itself on who Mary is, and then look into the way the early church fathers, the very first Christians, understood as well. We're looking at the very roots of Mary in the Bible, and then those very first interpreters of the Bible, oftentimes those who learn from the apostles themselves. It's a fantastic episode, and a great episode to share with those who might be wondering about Mary looking into Mary, or or struggling as many converts do with the idea of Mary and the emphasis that the church places on her and her character and who she is and her role in salvation history. It's a fantastic episode. I think you're going to love it. This conversation and all our conversations are brought to you by my patrons at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. If you can give anything towards this show, it helps to keep this thing going and growing. If you can give $5 or more a month, you're entered automatically into free draws for books every single month. That's my way of saying thanks. All patrons have access to an exclusive behind-the-scenes podcast and exclusive early access to podcasts as well. Thanks to those already supporting the show, and thank you to you for listening. Please, if you can, leave a rating and a review and tell a friend about this show as well. Thank you. And now, without any further ado, here's my fantastic conversation with William Albrecht and Father Christian Kappas on the historical and biblical Mary. Please listen and enjoy. Hey guys, and welcome back to The Cordial Catholic. Thanks for joining us again this week. We're going to have a fantastic conversation about Mary this week from the biblical and ancient church perspective. It's going to be fantastic. I'm joined by two guests who have written together just a fantastic book I'll tell you about in a second here. Uh, The first guest is William Albrecht. He's an international speaker and debater. He has been in over 65 live and moderated debates. He frequently appears on the Worldwide Global Catholic Network, EWTN, Virgin Most Powerful Radio, and is one of the co-hosts on Reason and Theology. He runs a website dedicated to the early church fathers that includes unique translations, articles, commentaries, and debates on the fathers. It's fantastic, and it's at patristicpillars.com. William, welcome to the show, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. I'm also joined by your co-author, Father Christian Kappas, who is the academic dean and professor at Saints Cyril and Methodius Byzantine Catholic Seminary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's the author of numerous books and articles in peer-reviewed publications that touch upon Mariology and is cited as one of the top Mariologists in the world. And you guys together have written this fantastic book, Mary Among the Evangelists, uh, just out available uh, recently, a fantastic book. 
Thanks for the book, and thank you, Father, for being here as well. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much for thinking of us and inviting us. Oh, absolutely. And I can't say enough good things about this book. I really can't. Uh, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Gary Machuda, and I were talking about this book, and he said, and, you know, of course, he's a research nerd. He says this very openly on this show, and he was on here again recently. And he said that uh, it's rare these days when a book about anything in the Catholic world kind of discovers or rediscovers new things. And one of the things that him and I loved about your book uh, is that you bring you bring these discoveries. I mean, these aren't these aren't brand new things. No one thought of a book before, but you have re rediscovered and, and brought back to popular discussion these these ideas that were that were known in the early church, were known by the early church fathers, are are found in scripture, but you've almost uh, unearthed them again for consumption. And that's so rare these days, and it adds so much to the discussion around Mary. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, both of you, for this fantastic book. It was a fun project. Uh, I know uh, just uh, as the first to kind of speak is, uh, I think you hit it right on the head. We um, we we did a little bit of uh, what they call a florilegium, a little bee buzzing around and picking the pretty flowers with all the nice pollen on them to make nectar out of where we, instead of being forced to go to many different ancient authors and uh, to see what they say about the original languages of the Old Testament and New Testament, we cherry picked or we uh, kind of buzzing bees went around to flower to flower and then we put it together into a full narrative instead of requiring someone to read all these vast pieces of disparate literature that are in different languages or at different times. I, Maybe William would like to add something to that. Yeah, I totally agree. I think Father has made a fantastic point there. And really the incredible thing about the book is it really is about um, kind of like a full year's worth of, um, of dialogue uh, going back and forth and talking about Mariology and then realizing that within the field of Mariology, there was uh, uh, kind of like a, a little bit of a gaping hole. There are a lot of really good books of Mary out there, a lot of great books spiritually on spirituality, and then really good books um, such as our friend Mike Aquilina's book on the history of Mary, you know, the Battle of Lepanto, uh, Our Lady of the Rosie, Rosary, and what have you. But in terms of a book that actually dealt with so-called issues of Mariology, we noticed that there really wasn't anything out there other than, uh, you know, stuff that was deemed scholarly uh, many years back, but really kind of was, uh, you know, uh, you know, a bit too skeptical for our liking in the sense that rather than dealing with what the early church said about Mary, it took a very negative tone in man many areas. So what we went ahead and did, and the incredible thing, and I always tell Father this, as he has an incredible gift. He reads the Bible and he reads the fathers as a Greek Christian would do it. So uh, with that in mind, what I think we can fairly safe in, in a safe way say is, whereas we're not reinventing the wheel, we are rediscovering many texts and many manners of looking into Mariology that maybe were forgotten over time. Definitely not uh, nothing that has been invented, but maybe the way Mariology was looked at in the ancient church, kind of uh, uh, rediscovering that and really bringing that to the forefront again. And I think it's really touched a lot of lives. Um, uh, and the incredible thing about it is we dialogue with Protestants as well. And if you look at, um, you know, by the, by the grace of God, if you look at some of the reviews we have on the, uh, on Amazon from the book, a few are from Protestants and we don't have, we don't have only endorsements from Catholics, but we have from non-Catholic scholars as well that have uh, openly endorsed this book. Yeah, well, th that's perfect for, for this show, I should say, too, because, you know, I'm an evangelical convert to Catholicism, and lots of listeners to this show are converts or converting or looking into the Catholic faith more seriously. And Mary is one of those great big issues that's often a stumbling block for Protestants looking at the Catholic Church. You know, we we can't understand, or I couldn't understand as an evangelical, why Catholics saw Mary as something so important, someone so important. We, we saw her as Jesus' mother, as evangelicals, and, you know, that's obviously an important role, but she was almost downplayed in the Protestant church because we were afraid of giving her too much emphasis and turning her into an idol or something as, as those Catholics did over there, right? But what your mm -hmm. book does is 
is shows how in the scriptures and in the early church how Mary was understood. And you know, I can think of in my own conversion experience, I was talking to this to, to someone one time about why I was becoming Catholic and looking into the church and I said something to the, the effect of, well, I want to look at how the church used to be into the early church and, and kind of get to know what that church was like and then join the church that looks like that. I know I saw an importance in 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 well, I saw a, a contrast, I should say, between my evangelical church and what I was reading about in the early church from the early church fathers. And so I wanted to find where the early church still was. And I realized the Catholic Church looked a lot like that. But this guy said to me, he said, Why why is earlier any better? Like why would you want something that's older or more original? Why is that a better kind of Christianity? And you know, at the time I was a bit stumped because this guy had a number of degrees and was very intelligent and I was just a lowly kind of convert looking into the Catholic Church. And I didn't know what to say to him, but looking back now, I have a lot more I would say. And and your book plays a role in that because if we can understand how the early Christians understood the scriptures and understood Mary, that's important for our faith. In the same way that as an evangelical looking into the early church, it's important to know how those very first Christians worshipped because they were the ones closest to Christ and the apostles. In the same way that these early church fathers writing about Mary and understanding scripture in a certain way, they, they were the, the closest ones to the apostles, to Jesus, to those who had who had known from Christ, who had maybe even in some cases known or, or spoken to, to Mary. So what you guys do in this book, right, is is to look at the scriptures, to look at the what the evangelists say about Mary through that lens, right, of the early church, of those very first Christians. Am I right in saying that? Oh, yeah. And uh, as you were talking, uh, my own mind was going to the fact that on one hand, uh, what we're doing is we're kind of doing a little bit of a time machine where we're uh, running back to the first century. And uh, when you went into your biblical shop, so to speak, of course, those didn't quite exist then, but when you went into your Bible store, uh, you uh, didn't really have a lot of options there. You just had the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Bible. And uh, if you wanted to do Bible studies in the common language that everybody spoke, you'd be using the old Greek Bible. And a lot of what you see in our, our uh, work is trying to show you how everybody, uh, those early Christians, those apostles, or those uh, individuals who were taught by the apostles who are mentioned, or quoted in the scriptures, all of them are reading the same book. And we oftentimes get distracted with other books, uh, maybe with some Aramaic here or there, or some Hebrew here and there, but that's not 90% of the time uh, what the first century Christians are quoting from. They're quoting from this old Greek Bible. That, On the other hand, you, the good news is, we don't want you to have to get distracted by the Greek. If you like the Greek, uh, it's available in footnotes, or it's available in parentheses. But the book is designed to provide an easy-to-read English that lets you see all the word plays that are going on, all the memory uh, devices that are going on by key vocabulary that gets repeated by, let's say, Luke, that he's quoting from his favorite Bible verses, and that he's kind of constructing his stories about who Mary is based off of familiar vocabulary, familiar key words, that any Christian using the only available edition of the Bible is going to know by heart. Yeah, I think that's so important to recognize, and we we lose that, right, in our translations of the Bible. We go into, as you said, the Bible store, and there's all kinds of different translations, and we, we lose some of that wordplay and those things that that to the, the early Christians would have been obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, that, really good points there, and I, I greatly appreciate that, uh, uh, Father. And, and uh, the one thing that I think is, is really important that Father brought up is uh, the one translation that uh, the early church would have uh, recognized quite well would have been the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And Luke would have clearly known that. I mean, not only Luke, we deal with all of the evangelists, but in particular, talking about Luke where where we encounter such incredibly rich Mariology. And you brought up a really good point, um, Keith. And that, that really good point was that um, uh, really it's, you would have imagined that some of these incredible figures that we're talking about would have known Mary, perhaps. And if you look at what the early fathers say, if you look at what the Venerable Bede says, and if you look at what scholars clearly know 
would have been the very fact that Luke very likely interviewed Mary. I mean, he's telling us he interviewed people, spoke with people, gathered an account of things. He's writing from the historical perspective, similar to Thucydides, and clearly, if there's anybody that would have told him an account of uh, of what went on in her life, it would have been Mary. It very likely he did interview Mary. So we've got a figure writing as a historian, and he's putting things in a historical perspective for us to understand in a more in a simpler manner. And really, the kind of approach we take in the book is um, is not the approach that okay, well, look, we have an objection in Luke eleven or we have an objection in John 2, let us give you an answer and let us just throw a ton of church fathers at the wall. What we do is we put the passage in question, the so-called problem that um, that an evangelical or really even a non-believer, even a Catholic might encounter, and um, we, we allow scripture to provide the very answers within the very context, such as, for one example, uh, you look at Luke 11, we frequently hear... Why is Mary being, uh, you know, being degraded there by Christ? You know, what's going on when we read um, in Luke eleven twenty eight? 28, while he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. But he said, blessed rather are those that hear the word of God and obey it. And, and I'm sure, uh, Keith, you know, just to get feedback from you, I'm sure you're very familiar and you probably even use that as an evangelical against Catholics. Am I right? <laughs> Oh, indeed. Yeah, that, that, that's the incredible thing. Uh, by the way, I'm also a convert. I would have used that as well. But the incredible thing is, is when we allow Scripture to kind of really unfold and, and provide the answers for us, which should uh, really provide the key to any good evangelical. They should, and we've indeed had fantastic feedback with people saying, "Wow, you guys are letting the Bible." provide the answers within the very text itself because if we look at if we look at the text we notice that there's a play in words occurring here in luke 1 the word of the lord the logos comes to zechariah now what does he do he hears the word of god and he doesn't believe it he's muted so you clearly you see clearly the play on the word the logos is said to mary by the angel the word, and she believes. So she hears a logos from the angel. She vouchsafes it. She keeps it. So what is really the only story that Luke could be referring to in Luke 11? Which one? It is clear, and the patristic interpretation is very clear. As by the way, we get that uh, we get it directly from the fathers. They recognize this as well because Christ is not denying the blessedness of his mother. Rather, he's making it very clear. The conclusion is that Christ that Luke wants us to recognize that Christ is saying that, that rather he wants us to draw from the text that rather than being blessed for a biological kind of praise, Mary's yes is declared blessed because she's the first one who heard the word, the logos, who then believed unlike Sarah and unlike Zechariah, she is the one that kept the word and even said, um, that is why we read that uh, from Augustine, Mary was more blessed in accepting the faith than in conceiving the flesh of Christ. I mean, it may be a conundrum, but wrapping your mind around that, it's incredible. And it really allows the text to kind of unfold. <laughs> That's fantastic. We're just getting started too. That's great. I want to ask you, so there are all kinds of things in this book that, as an evangelical, I would have had a struggle with. And I would have pointed to these things as, well, this can't possibly mean what you say. As you've mentioned just now, it's a fantastic example. But we would have used these things against against Catholics who would argue for all kinds of things about Mary and her special place. And one of those things is the idea of the brothers and sisters of Jesus. So, you know, Catholics would affirm that that Mary remained a virgin after Jesus was born. And the common objection is, to, is well, right here in, in the Bible, in, in the Gospels, it seems to indicate that Jesus has brothers and sisters. And as you mentioned, he even at some point seems to rebuke his family for not believing in him or for, or, or you know, they're, they're outside in one scene and he says, no, 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 I, I don't want anything to do with them. And, and we would have pointed to that as evangelicals, as Protestant Christians, to kind of uh, work against the Catholic claim that Mary uh, remained a virgin or that, and said, look, Jesus had a whole family. He had brothers and sisters here. So 
what's going on in there and how do you unpack that looking at 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 the person of Mary in the scriptures and in the early church how do you address that well uh, of course there's all these uh, gospels that we're so used to to looking at Keith and one of the one of the ones that I was the most surprised by was in Mark's gospel uh, in Mark 3 chapter 3 and Mark 6 and uh, perhaps um, even before we get to that, one of the other things that is highlighted in Matthew's gospel, I'll talk about first and then move to Mark. Um, but the scripture that grants us keys, um, Matthew is almost always uh, universally considered the first gospel. Now, we know that scholars will argue that Mark may be and probably is a little bit earlier. Uh, but as far as how early Christians organize their Bibles, they may have placed the epistles of certain saints or apostles in a different order, but by and large, uh, all the early collections want to put Matthew as the first gospel in the front of the early collections of the gospels. And what is so key about that is, if you look at Matthew chapter 1 and the first two verses, you already learn who the brothers and, and sisters of Jesus can be, because right there, the, the um, paradigm is given us that uh, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had their own children, and that when Jacob had his children, he had 12 of them. But they were by four different women, and they're all called brothers of each other. And so we already see that brothers, as a key term, is presented to us for the rest of Matthew's gospel as being brothers of a different mother. And in fact, that's what we're going to find out, that Jesus will technically, uh, especially in Mark's gospel, uh, lead us to understand uh, but already in Matthew, we're given a little key to that by him widening that for us. And of course, we know that in the Septuagint or the Greek Old Testament, uh, there's so many examples of where brother is defined as uh, someone who has a different mother uh, and is a half-brother or a half-sister. Of course, Abraham and Sarah have this very uh, use of brother, which could explain to some extent the reason why it's so precious for the gospel writers to keep calling uh, Jesus as brothers and sisters by that very technical uh, Old Testament name. But um, I think more importantly, we see that in uh, Mark's gospel, in the sixth chapter, there's a really neat thing that's going on there that we, we outline in the most obvious way that you can uh, possibly study it, and that is we show the structure of an argument made by Jesus' enemies. Jesus' enemies try to say that Jesus isn't really worthwhile living, uh, believing in, in Nazareth, because when he returns home, uh, his mother is without honor in the list, and then the second person that is uh, listed are his uh, brothers, Josies, and uh, three other brothers. And finally, that there's an actual opposition from his sisters, as they're called. And what's really fantastic is that in the very next lines of Mark's gospel, when his enemies very succinct list, that goes from mother without honor, brothers who don't seem to have any fame, and then finally sisters who are in just negative opposition to him. Jesus lists these people technically. First, he skips over his mother because he doesn't consider her a person that should be responded to by his enemies list, by someone without honor. But then when he admits, tit for tat, that there is this group that are called his brothers and that they don't have, you know, any special role, they're not royalty, they're not anything that would be equivalent to a movie star in their own time and place. He does admit that they don't bring honor to him, but he calls them sin genis, that is, his cousins. Uh, and technically speaking, if you actually look at the word that Jesus names his four brothers as, he specifically calls them syngenes, which is defined in the best lexicons or Greek dictionaries as children of another mother. And so we have right there in Jesus's own response to his enemy's very exact list, the identification of his brothers as children of another mother. And then he goes on and he responds in the same list to those people who are living at the house at Nazareth who are identified as his sisters. And he refers to those individuals as being cousins as well, uh, who uh, we find out are his extended family. Uh, because the people that live in one's house 
are extended family. And we say, well, how do we know this? Well, believe it or not, in Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel and in Mark's gospel, we're able to show that he, all three of them are quoting from the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, it divides a family into a Jewish uh, kind of family, which is the nation as a whole, the 12 tribes. Uh, then you have your house of your own father, and then you have your extended family, which are called your cousins. These are the exact divisions that Matthew, Mark, Luke make when they talk about Jesus's family, when Jesus cites his own family. And it's once we've discovered from St. Jerome where, where that family division is coming from, from the book of Numbers, then we can see that Jesus is actually not just in general talking about his family, but he's very precisely telling us who these women are. They're members of his father's extended cousins, his extended family, and that uh, the brothers are quite clearly uh, people who are born of a different mother than Mary. And uh, I'm, I'll bet you that probably William wants to jump in here and tell us a little bit about the early fathers and how they build on what I just said. Yeah, that's a really good point there. Um, and, and the early fathers, they, they really do. Uh, father, you know, he, he, he knows me very well. In fact, um, I would say the one incredible thing, Keith, here is when we look at the early fathers, uh, you don't have anybody. You don't have anybody in the early era eras of church history that denies the very fact that Mary was a perpetual, perpetual virgin. In fact, they recognized, and indeed it is one thing that you'll find in our book, the very fact that we bring forth incredible testimony from uh, very, very incredible figures such as, and these are doctors of the church, mind you, these are figures that uh, were recognized as massive pillars within the faith, such as the great St. Jerome who recognizes that the perpetual virginity of Mary was biblical and ancient. And then John Chrysostomos, John Chrysostom, a native Greek speaker that recognized that Mary never had any other child other than Christ. So we've got tons of these figures. Uh, and indeed, we, 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 uh, we reference a number of times the Proto-Evangelium of James, Keith. But what is the point of bringing up these ancient testimonies? The point is real simple. The point is the early church fathers recognized, um, because of this very fact that Father brings forth, recognize that these so-called, these brothers and sisters were not the children of Mary. This is recognized from the very beginning. Now, I'd like to add one thing, Keith, and maybe, maybe the audience will recognize, but when I first converted to Catholicism and I found out that the very first person to categorically deny that Mary remained a perpetual virgin was an Arian monk, I was blown away, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not in great company to make those kind of denials, right? No, no, not in great company uh, at all. And I mean, I think, uh, I mean, it really kind of tying into that, tying into the very fact you'll, you'll, you'll then have somebody follow that up. Because uh, mind you, and we cover that in the book, by the way, uh, you'll have somebody follow up and they'll say, well, okay, look, fine, they'll say. Maybe, the, maybe we'll grant you that perhaps Mary did not have other children, or maybe they're not listed in the Bible. You know, maybe we'll give you that, but then they'll say, but you know what? We want you to show us biblically. We don't want to hear about these writers from a hundred or two or 300 years later. We want you to show us biblically that Mary actually intended to remain a virgin. And if you want, Keith, I can briefly unpack that for you. Uh, and this you can find even more in depth directly in our book. If you're interested, I can briefly unpack that we, we, we will safely say, comfortably say, we believe the Bible shows without a shadow of a doubt, Mary took a vow of virginity. I do want you to unpack this for me, absolutely, because it's one thing to discover or to affirm, okay, this evidence looks very solid right from the Bible. It's very clear in how you present this, and you, you and, and the early church affirms this kind of a presentation, uh, the idea that these were not uh, her ch Mary's children, uh, Jesus' brothers and sisters in that sense. But it's another thing entirely, as you say, to recognize that Mary always intended to remain a virgin, and that was her intent. So I'd love you to unpack that for our listeners just a little bit. 
Definitely. And, and, and again, Keith, uh, this is just incredible. Um, the fact that when we recognize that these figures that we're talking about, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they, <clears throat> they would have recognized that their audience would have been very familiar with what we call the Septuagint. What is that? That is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that the early church and the apostles in Christ were utilizing. So really, in order to kind of unpack it, we go to Judges 11, 11, 37 to 39. And when we get there, we realize this is definitely the reason the fathers held, tell to the divine tradition that Mary had taken a perpetual vow of virginity. So what we have here is in the beginning, Jephthah makes a vow to God before battle. And, and the incredible thing is we have the spirit of the Lord giving inspiration to Jephthah to make the vow. If he wins the battle, the very first thing he encounters in the way back to home from battle, he will offer it up to the Lord as sacrifice. Now, the one thing we're not going to get into, it would be a conversation for a whole other day, is kind of the shock of, wow, well, you know, anything he, for the first thing he encounters, he's going to offer it up as a sacrifice. That's a conversation for another day. The, the kind of thing that we want to zero in on are the biblical roots for the perpetual vow of virginity taken by Mary, and the points in Holy Writ are very clear. Jephthah, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, makes a vow, and when he encounters his daughter, and she is notifi notified of the unfortunate, unfortunate for her, circumstance, she responds by saying, and she said to her father, let this be done for me. And so we realize that sound may, may sound very familiar to your <laughs> listeners. It, it definitely has to. So we also read, let me alone for two months. She's going to be well her virginity. And remember, what, what, what does that hearken to? We remember Mary. Well, Mary visited Elizabeth for three months. Well, Jephthah's daughter is going to be let alone for two months. She's going to return in the third month as she's left alone for two. She goes away to mourn and bewail her virginity. But she, fi and she finds out that she has been vowed to perpetual virginity as a sacrifice. Remember, we talked about Luke, Keith. Luke, the incredible historian that he is, catches this perfectly. Mary is saying the exact words in Luke 1. How can this be since I do not know man? By the way, the fathers viewed these words here as a vow. You know, you can find it in Augustine, Ambrose, and many others. But back to Judges, in the third month, the vow was carried out. The text is very clear. She knew no man. And the incredible things that we're hearing as Father has shown to us about the brothers and the sisters in the text. Well, I'd like to add, to add one more thing. Uh, in the incredibly meticulous work that Father has done, and masterful work, I may add, uh, thank the good Lord that uh, uh, you know he was helped by the ancient texts and the ancient fathers. In all Greek literature, if you look at the Thesaurus Lingua Grecia, in all of Greek literature before the 180, there are only two areas with this citation, Judges 11 and Luke 1. Luke, Keith, is directly quoting this verse. He's telling us she knew not man. She remained a perpetual virgin. So breaking it down, Mary answers the angel Gabriel, how can this be that I am going to have a child when I am a perpetual virgin? I've been vowed to the Lord God. As the text uses over and over, kudios for God. I have been vowed to God like Jephthah's daughter. Then, of course, the very famous text that every Catholic and evangelical will know from, from Luke, where Mary utters, let it be done to me according to thy word. Remember, Luke was a historian writing the style of Thucydides. He knew his audience. His audience would have been very familiar with the book of Judges. It is without a doubt that Mary is referring to the fact that she had taken a vow of virginity. <laughs> That's fantastic. I guess my question, my follow-up question from an evangelical lens, or even from the Catholic lens, for the Catholic who doesn't quite grasp the importance of this, and I don't know maybe if, if you want to answer this question, Father, why is it important? Why is it important that Mary had this vow of virginity and remained a virgin? Why is that important for who she is? Yeah, there's a, that's a many-pronged answer, so I'll give some, some major ones. I think the first one is uh, typology. Again, Luke, throughout chapter 1 and throughout chapter 2, as we show by comparing for you uh, the books of 
in your Dewey Rames Bible, it would be called the books of Kings or the books of Samuel and Kings, as well as Judges, that um, Mary is, is quite obviously the new Ark of the Covenant. And this new Ark is not supposed to be touched by any hands to, that are merely human to soil it or in any way uh, to imply that anyone else but God uh, has his hands, so to speak, on it. The manna, the rod of Aaron, and these sorts of things are the miraculous items that are allowed to be in the ark. So the, the first reason seems to be typological, to really heighten Mary's uh, special role in the history of salvation. The second reason, though, uh, is to cast absolute, um, you might say, uh, or to certify absolutely that Mary could not have had any children other than Christ, who is the only legitimate claimant of being the seed of Abraham. Uh, the way that kingship works is if Jesus is killed, um, shouldn't a family member that's in the line of Mary take over the kingship? Or uh, don't we have issues with the fact that uh, if, if Mary has uh, other children, then who's to say it calls into doubt uh, whether or not her first child was miraculous? Once we determine that she was a perpetual virgin and she had no relations with anyone, then the gospel writer makes it easy for us to accept the virgin conception and the virgin birth. And then lastly, um, this idea of making a perpetual vow of virginity, which is fruitful. It brings about the Savior. This ends up being a paradigm that is an example for us all. We see Jesus follow his mother's example. He himself does not marry. And either he does so intentionally or, you know, he just never, so to speak, met the right girl. I mean, is it that Jesus was a bachelor that just never kind of found the right person in his life? Or uh, is there something sacred about his choice? And, of course, we as Christians and Catholics understand that Jesus is doing things as an exemplar, as an example for us. It's not just by chance. Uh, that he's not married. And so what we see is that Mary and Jesus form a female and a male example of perpetual virginity. Mary uh, is quite clearly dedicated uh, to perpetual virginity. And the implication that we make, uh, therefore, is Christ is also a perpetual virgin. And then by extension, we see whether or not St. Paul himself uh, had ever been married or not, he became, so to speak, a virgin in the sense that he vowed himself to no relations and to take no advantage of a wife, as he does in 1 Corinthians 7. So essentially the example of both Jesus and Mary of perpetual virginity uh, provides a paradigm that's immediately followed up by St. Paul. Of course, this is the source for our religious monks and nuns and priests vowing their virginity to Almighty God or their celibacy to him uh, because it is a pleasing sacrifice in the very same ways that Luke shows Mary's sacrifice was pleasing in her first two chapters of the New Testament. <laughs> That's fantastic. And you mentioned the, the Mary as Ark of the New Covenant, and we could really do a, a, I mean, a, a, a several hour episode on just that topic. But I wonder, I mean, because that for me, and maybe for you too, William, was discovering that, discovering that in the early church and how that idea of Mary as the new Ark of the Covenant really shapes the the theology and understanding of the uh, that Catholics bring to Mary and how we understand who she is and all that that entails. I mean, it's enormous to to understand that. So I wonder maybe if we could dig a little bit into that as you, as both of you do in this book. What is this idea? Because this, again, this sounds very foreign to any non-Catholic Christian listener. I think this idea of, of Mary as the new Ark, they kind of go as I did, like, what what are we talking about here? Can you begin to fill in some gaps for us here, William? Yeah, definitely. And that's, what, a, what a great uh, great point you bring up there. Uh, because really, as, as Catholics, when we talk about Mary as the Ark of the Lord, as the Mother of the Lord, as the Ark of the New Covenant, uh, at times we can get looked at, I guess, um, in, a, in a bit of a, an odd way by our evangelical brothers and sisters. And they may be wondering, what are you all talking about without kind of realizing that the very fact that we're using, utilizing this language for Mary 
it has at its core biblical foundations because Luke in particular, Luke the evangelist, he's rearranging the material in his work in his very first chapters to put that very strong parallelism between Mary, the mother of the Lord, and the ark of the Lord. And what, he's, what is he doing by doing, how does he do this? He begins to compare the Old Testament. He's looking directly at the, as we talked about earlier, that Septuagint. What is the Septuagint? The Greek translation of the Old Testament. He's relying on that for his vocabulary, for the phraseology that he is going to be utilizing. So really, we kind of see a, a number of things. So what, what is occurring? Um, first off, parallelism. If we look at 2 Samuel 6, 2 and 5, 10, we read, and David went to the ark of the Lord on the mountain, and David was playing, and how will the ark of the Lord enter unto me? We read that in 2 Samuel 6. So then we hop on over into Luke 1, and we read about Mary going into the mountains, and we read that, and it happened as Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary. The child, talking about John, leapt in her womb, and she said, once this is happening to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. So language right away that we see here, um, in particular, we see similarities in the Greek here. And then not only that, but what about the similarities of events that are occurring? In 2 Samuel, the ark travels to the house of Ob Obedidim in the hill country of Judea. Well, what about in Luke 1? Well, Mary's going to the house of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Where? In the hill country of Judea, 2 Samuel 6, 14. David, addressed as a priest, is dancing and leaping in front of the ark. And in Luke 1, 41, John the Baptist, as we all know, as all the fathers indicated as well, who is of priestly lineage, is leaping in his mother's womb when Mary is approaching him. David asks, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Mary, as we said a little while ago, how is it granted unto me? That the mother, Elizabeth, excuse me, how is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I'd add one other thing, Keith. Every time that Greek word, kudios, the Greek word for Lord, is utilized in Luke 1, every time it is utilized for God Almighty, for Yahweh. So literally when we read, why is it granted to me that the mother of my God should come to me, is the clear meaning of the text. David is shouting in the presence of the ark in 2 Samuel 6, and Elizabeth in Luke 142, I believe, is, is also exclaiming with a loud cry in the presence of Mary. Same exact Greek word. The ark remains in the house, as we said, of Obed-Edom for multiple months, three months, Mary in Elizabeth's house for three months. And, and, and in kind of a bit of a finality, <clears throat> when the ark goes back home, it, where does it end up? It ends up in Jerusalem, where the presence of God and the glory is revealed in the temple. Well, where does Mary end up? Mary eventually returns home, ending up in Jerusalem, where she presents who? Who is she presented? There's, remember, in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel, it's God's presence and the glory that is revealed. Well, what more incredible thing is presented by Mary other than our God incarnate that is presented in the temple, which will eventually directly lead us to that very all-important uh, passage, which I'm very proud to say, Keith, I'm unaware of any other book um, that has taken the time to provide a whole chapter dealing with the intricacies of the, of the so-called purification of Mary that does occur in Luke 2. But all of this is directly connected to what is going on. Mary is being revealed here directly in the language of the New Testament, hearkening to the Old Testament language. She's being revealed as the new ark. Remember, what is, a, what is in the old ark? You've got the tablets of the law. The word of God is inscribed on stone. Well, the body of Christ, the word of God incarnate in flesh is in Mary. The urn, um, the urn with the manna from the wilderness, um, the, the incredible bread come down from heaven is, is in the ark of the old covenant. Well, the true manna, the, the living manna, the eternal manna, the womb that has Jesus has that eternal manna. Mary's got that. The parallelism is just mind blowing indeed. And it, you know, it really fires me up for the faith. It's incredible because we also have, what, what else do we have? We have the rod of Aaron um, that bud, that budded to prove um, and to defend the true uh, the true high priest. Well, what is inside Mary? 
as as uh, as Hebrews tells us, as the book of Hebrews says, hearkening to the book of Genesis, we have our actual and our eternal high priest from the order of Melchizedek. Just the language is just mind-blowingly beautiful, isn't it, Keith? <laughs> you sound exactly how I felt when I first encountered some of these things in the in the fathers and in and reading some books about uh, about Mary as the new ark. This is exactly how I felt the enthusiasm in your voice because it's this massive discovery that really is is virtually unknown in the Protestant evangelical world, at least the circles that I traveled in as a kind of a non-denominational, maybe a bit of a charismatic Pentecostal uh, Christian. This was virtually unknown to me, yet it was, is foundational. I mean, you. what I love here, for one thing, William, is you haven't even touched on the early church fathers yet. You've just used the Bible <laughs> yeah. and typology, which, which Christ himself uses as a means of interpreting scripture, this idea of typology of the old being revealed uh, or, or the, yeah, the old being revealed in, in the new or hidden and revealed kind of in the new, you know, taking this kind of stuff. This is what Christ himself does and the apostles and writers of the gospels do as well. This isn't you and father here inventing some kind of new way of interpreting the Bible. This is just using scripture to get to these conclusions. Never mind the early church, right? And how exciting is this to discover all along that, that, that Mary was this to the authors of the of the of the Bible, and then to the early church, and then to Catholics all down through time. And that discovery for me, I'm sure for you too, was just was just mind blowing. It was it was amazing. Yeah, it really was amazing. And uh, and really, to be quite honest, Keith, it's really what I just described right now. Uh, that's the amazing thing. And you know, uh, we're very blessed that uh, that our book is just packed with theological information because really what I just described is kind of really just scratching the surface on Mary <laughs> as a new ark. Maybe you can kind of pick up where I left off there, Father, because you know very well there's so much more as Mary as new as a new ark that really can be uncovered, isn't there? Oh well, yeah, it's 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 pretty much throughout uh, Luke's gospel. We also can't forget John's gospel, which isn't a major focus um, for the work that we're doing because it's on passages which are specifically Marian. But um, we'll, once you understand uh, that Mary is the new ark and that her flesh provides uh, this uh, tent, so to speak, uh, for Jesus. Uh, because the ark was always associated with the skin tent that had to be placed over it. Then you start seeing Jesus's own playing with his language in John's gospel, that uh, he is uh, not only the bread that came down from heaven, but that he pitched a tent with us like an ark. Uh, then you begin to make connections between the transfiguration. Uh, when Peter says, let's build three tents, he's talking about the ark being in the center of the traveling group of Israel. Uh, that uh, is kind of Peter's focus there, and that the Ark of the Covenant is the center of the worship that's going on. And and we even touch a little bit on the fact that um, if you notice uh, in the Transfiguration, you wouldn't think of it being a Marian, but the word overshadowing, which is only used at Mary's Annunciation in Luke's Gospel, is also used to represent uh, what's happening on the mountain of transfiguration. And the early fathers understood this very, very well. That overshadowing is happening all over the Old Testament, but it's always God's most intense presence. Uh, the overshadowing on Mount Sinai of Moses, the overshadowing in the meeting tent by a cloud and a shadow where Yahweh's most intense presence comes. Then we see in the New Testament, it's only used twice. Mary's Annunciation in Luke's Gospel, where she becomes the new tent, uh, the new skin-covered uh, being who, in whose ark or in whose storage space is the new manna. Uh, but you also see that the Transfiguration talks about this overshadowing. But even there, the fathers can dig out the Marian theme, because if there's an overshadowing going on, it's something like an ark going on. And we should expect then that the Ark of the Covenant had two cherubim, and these two cherubim, their wings overshadowed the Ark. So we see Jesus flanked by two beings, Moses and Elijah. Uh, now, they're not divine, so they can't actually overshadow. That's a divine being's job. But the cloud overshadows, and Elijah and Moses are, in a certain sense, uh, saccharine substitutes uh, for the divine cherubim that are overshadowing. And I say divine cherubim 
because the cherubim are actually, according to Jewish scholars like Philo of Alexandria in 40 AD, and the most ancient Christian scholars taught by Jews like Origen, whom we know was living in the 100s, teaching in the 200s, they all saw this, that the overshadowing wings over the ark were the sun and the spirit. They were images of the sun and the spirit who were divine beings that would cast the most intense presence of Yahweh. So when Mary is overshadowed by the power of the Most High, that's Jesus' name, according to St. Paul, the wisdom and the power of God. So the power of God, Jesus the Most High, overshadows her uh, in Luke's Gospel, and the Holy Spirit come upon her, just like the two cherubim uh, foreshadow this in the Old Testament. And then, finally, the Transfiguration is another overshadowing. It is an overshadowing by cloud, uh, and then he's flanked by two beings, the humans, uh, Elijah and Moses. But what's most interesting here is that the early fathers pick up on the fact that this is our ability to be, uh, in a certain sense, mini Marys. We can't have her experience uh, in Luke 1 of having an overshadowing within our tummies, within our wombs, and bearing uh, the Word made flesh. So what we can have is we can have a transfiguration experience. And that is we can be overshadowed, not directly, but get a glimpse of the glory of the Lord when he is overshadowed on the mountain. And we immediately are inspired uh, to think of Mary and build some tents around the uh, meeting place and to uh, participate in this divine worship, uh, which is centered on the ark. Uh, Origen finds this, and so he interprets all the transfiguration as simply being uh, our human attempts at having a little bit of the taste of what happens in Luke 135 at Mary's overshadowing. And these sorts of images are all there in the book when we go over quite thoroughly the Old Testament overshadowings which lead to Mary, and we even give you some hints of the transfiguration in a certain sense being a reflection of Mary as Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> That's simply fantastic. And I and I guess, William, I want to ask what you think about this, because it, it seems like, and I can see a listener who's not a Catholic listening to this episode or reading this book and... and and going, okay, guys, this is a lot of legwork. This is a lot of interpreting things and 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 maybe putting your lens on a certain perspective or or kind of working these passages out a certain way to 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 see these things. I mean, so let's put aside for one that the early church saw these things too. It's not just a, a modern reading of these passages. But the other thing that I came to realize is that okay, even as non-Catholic Christians. We still accept, or we still accept, and 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 importantly, see the Bible as being inspired by God. And so, if the Bible is inspired and infallible, the evangelical must wrestle with the fact that that Bible produces these kinds of connections and links and and typological connections that have to be reckoned with. It's not a mistake, in other words. It's not a mistake that these things are present and can be readily found in the Bible. Never mind that they were found in the early church. Like, let's put that aside for now. But just looking at the Bible in a vacuum, these things are obviously here, typologically. They're, they're here in all these, these word plays and these connections and these links between the Old Testament and the New Testament and even within the New Testament, these different linkages. I mean, if we're taking the Bible as divinely written and inspired, the evangelical Christian has to make something of these connections, right? What a, what a really fantastic point you bring up there, Keith, and you're, you're definitely correct. I think the one thing that we tend to forget at times is that whereas the Bible is very clear, uh, where the Bible is very clear, actually, uh, in terms of connecting Christology Christological references from the Old Testament into the New Testament. The Bible does the same thing with the Mariological references. And again, you make a fantastic point that we don't even need to delve into the, into the early fathers, but when we do do that, we're supplementing the massive amount of evidence that we already have. I mean, simply looking at the text, it is no coincidence that all of these passages are clearly hearkening to other areas in the Old Testament. The language, the kind of language that's being utilized, and this is one thing that I would like to point out to my evangelical brothers and sisters, is the language is only being used in this one other area, and we clearly have the author 
of the New Testament, hearkening to that which is in Holy Writ in the Old Testament. Would they then deny that the author of the Gospel of Matthew, when he's quoting that Mary is Parthenos, that Mary is that virgin from Isaiah chapter 7, would they deny that direct connection there? They wouldn't, would they? They would embrace it and they would say, well, hey, we know that the author is saying that uh, a virgin would conceive, would give birth to our Messiah, our Lord incarnate. Clearly, if we match up the Greek that is being hearkened to in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament uh, account of Isaiah, we know that's what's being talked about. Well, that is the exact thing we're doing here. We're looking at what scripture is hearkening to, and when we line it up, it is without a shadow of a doubt, it lines up perfectly. We're allowing scripture to interpret scripture. And really, uh, here's the one thing that I always say, is that if we, at first glance, if we pick up the book, and by the way, which by the way, we're very pleased to say that the feedback we've gotten is people have said, hey, this is written in a very easy to understand manner, which is, you know, very good. But I would add one thing. If there's anything that you may run into, you may say, well, look, this is tough to kind of wrap my mind around. Well, I'd like to remind you, you're not a, you, you know, you're not kind of like an island. You're not on an island alone. You know, even the great St. Peter said, there's, there's some things that St. Paul has written that have been tough to understand. So really, when if we think that there's certain things in the Bible that might be a little bit hard to wrap our minds around, the issue is not with the Bible itself. The issue might be with us. We might need to kind of look at it with ancient Christian lenses. And that is exactly what we're doing in this book. We're kind of putting on uh, the, what we would call um, a Greek Christian or a patristic Christian's lenses. <laughs> and we're looking at the Bible and we're allowing the biblical text to interpret itself. And when we do that, we reach one conclusion, actually, I'd like to, to correct myself. We reach multiple ones. We, the, multi, the conclusions are uh, Mary is definitely perpetual virgin, Ark of the New Covenant. She is to be given veneration and honor. She's clearly referred to as immaculate and a number of other things that clearly she's also the one that first heard the word and protected and kept that word in her very heart. She was a servant of that word. So there's a number of conclusions we reach when we allow the Bible to kind of really, uh, when we pull back that veil, if you will. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. And I want to I wanna dig deeper in a second to, to ask a bit more about those conclusions and what those conclusions kind of point towards, especially for those those listeners who don't really know a lot about Mariology. And this is kind of maybe a, a new revelation or a new discovery for them or a newer discovery or that new Catholic who is kind of digging deeper into these kind of things and going, wow, this is amazing. I want to ask more about those, those conclusions in a minute, but I want to just highlight what you said a minute ago because I think it's so very fundamental and very foundational to kind of underscore. And that's the idea that we are already, say, as an evangelical Christian, I already was looking at Christ through that kind of typological lens as he's revealed in the Old Testament and those prophecies are fulfilled in the New Testament. I was already doing that. And I was, as you said, too, for Mary. Like we see her prefigured in, in prophecy as, as this virgin. We make those connections, even as non-Catholic Christians. All you're saying is, look, you can make even more connections using that same hermeneutic. There's even more connections to be made between Mary in the Old Testament and the New. Using the same lens that I already use to make the ones that I already do make as an evangelical. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, that totally, totally makes sense. I and mean, you really, really kind of ties in perfectly. And, and as we pointed out, there's so many areas where, where really the connection is, uh, you know, left without a shadow of doubt. You know, what, uh, what, what is occurring here? We look at, um, uh, for instance, we look at Luke 1 where Mary is, uh, you know, uh, saying her Magnificat. You know, what is occurring? What is the uniqueness of the kind of language? And, you know, they're, they're really, really, in my opinion, when we allow the scripture to kind of, when you kind of pull back that veil, we get an image of Mary that, funny enough, we find this image uh, come to full light in the early church and really, as time goes on, we recognize that in Catholicism, and I don't want to say just Catholicism, because even our Eastern brothers and sisters would recognize uh, uh, the core doctrines and teachings that are found here. 
indeed we get an ancient view of Mary that has been consistent throughout history. And I, I don't know if you want to maybe add a little bit to that, Father, but I think that you kind of get a fuller view of Mary when you allow the text to speak for itself. Yeah, and that's been our project. Um, on a, in a particular presentation that we were invited to give, I immediately kind of started and said, look, this is not a, this is not a book for Catholics. This is a book for Christians because um, we're not using authorities um, that you need to be Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, uh, or of a particular Protestant sect. We're letting Scripture do the work for us, and we're just helping you feel like you're there, that you understand that this is the Bible that um, Luke or Mark or Matthew is quoting. Uh, this is the parts of the Bible that they're quoting. And when we give you the context and we organize the material for you with helpful little graphs, uh, which the hope is, is they, they're not too complex. And I think one of the most relieving things that William keeps getting with all the emails that he's getting is everyone telling us how readable it is. And so the experience that people are having is they don't need to be distracted by too many technicalities because there's, they start to develop this instinct to see how rich scripture is in regard to Mary. And the takeaway from all this is when scripture is left interpreting scripture, and you begin to get an instinct as we go chapter by chapter in the Gospels, the end result is, is that I think that your own antennae are very attuned to look now for the kind of patterns that we're finding. Uh, and one of the easiest things to point towards is you can begin to then to make sense of exaggerations or seeming exaggerations in Scripture. For example, when Elizabeth sees Mary, it, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I think it might be Luke 142, it's almost as if Jesus is being ignored. How is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And don't we have the incarnate Lord there? Uh, didn't John the Baptist just sleep in the womb? Isn't that a sign that we can expect that if uh, a human baby wants to make himself known, that we should expect the Lord of all to be the center of attention? And yet we're starting to see that to honor the mother of the Lord in Luke's gospel is key uh, to honoring the Lord himself. And so the takeaway from this is provided that we're based in the, what the scriptures are telling us the ways to honor Mary, which are the ways that Jesus does and the way that the gospel writers do uh, is that we can't walk away anymore after we read scripture uh, with all these very easy to experience and repeat and uh, these methods that are so, uh, it becomes so natural uh, by which to read scripture. We, we can't walk away anymore and say she's not playing an essential role when two chapters essentially of Luke's gospel are entirely get dedicated to her person, her qualities, and her mission. This means that we have to pay more attention to her to understand the fullness of the history of salvation as it's revealed in Jesus Christ. Well, Father, you've walked us perfectly up into my final question I wanted to ask the two of you, just beautifully, because it's this. And I mean, as a convert to the Catholic faith, I, as I became Catholic, realized, discovered so many things in the Catholic Church that I had not realized were, should have been part of my Christian faith life from the beginning. And Mary was one of those things. I'm thinking of things like the communion of the saints and, and the fact that I had a guardian angel and all these different things that that existed, whether I knew them or not, but discovering them would just kind of blew my mind and, and, and expanded my faith life just incredibly. I mean, it, it, it set my faith life on fire in a whole new way because I had access to all these things that I didn't even know that I had access to in the first place. So it was an amazing blessing. And Mary is one of those things that, I mean, I had no idea reading, reading in the gospels where Jesus gives her to John and gives her to all of us as our mother. I didn't quite understand what that meant. And so she wasn't any kind of mother to me as an evangelical. And I, of course, saw none of this typology, none of these connections that are made by the gospel writers. I saw none of those things. And so for me, she was not understood as she is in the Catholic Church and as I understand her now to be. And, and that, of course, has completely changed my faith life, deepened my faith life as a Catholic, understanding who Mary is. So... I don't want to. I don't want to telegraph too much here, William. But maybe you can you can explain to us a little bit about 
why does it matter that Mary is the new Ark and that she is petulantly virgin and, and that she was immaculately conceived and all these things that, that we as Catholics believe about Mary? Uh, why does that matter and how does that change the, the faith life of, of a Christian who becomes a Catholic? Can you answer that question? Does that make a little bit of sense to, to answer? It sure does, and it actually is a very good question. All of these things matter because, and, and this, this gets, uh, we get this question a lot, and it's a good one. It is one that we encourage people to really ponder on because the answer is really simple. People should believe it because it's biblical. And then after that, people should also believe it because it is historical. And the, the, the very first Christians, those that would have walked and talked the earth with our bodily risen Lord and Savior. Those that would have known the apostles best believe these things. They pass this tradition on. They pass these beliefs on in an unbroken chain throughout history to one another as time went down, as time went on. And what was the truth behind all of this? The truth is a real simple one. The truth is our Lord and Savior Christ, through his incredible graces, prepared for us a beautiful mother, a mother that was free from every stain of sin, a mother that would that that had from the very beginning had decided under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to definitely bring forth, bring forth to say her beautiful Magnifica, to have made that vow of virginity, and even more incredible, through the power of the Holy Ghost, through the guidance of the Holy Ghost, to have remained as she says, a loyal handmaid of the Lord. So when we read these kind of, kinds of things about Mary, um, we're, 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 put, we're put in a position that is one of ancient Christianity. And that position is we should believe these things because the, the Bible clearly tells us these things about Mary. And if the Bible is telling these things, these things about Mary, we recognize that she is that important figure that was foreshadowed in Genesis 3. The woman, remember, what do we read about the woman? We read that the woman, along with the Messiah that would come in the future, would both be very important in focal figures. They would both be at complete enmity, in complete opposition to Satan. So as soon as we literally open up the Bible, we have this incredible prophecy that has been dubbed the Proto-Evangelium. As soon as you open up the Bible, that incredible prophecy you have about Mary, it gets you right set in the foundations of what would come in the future. And what does come in the future? What comes in the future is our mother Mary, who we're directly told is the mother of our Lord, is the mother of God. So all of these truths that are found in the Bible really come to light, and we should really, really uh, ponder them, uh, think about them in our heart, pray about them, and really, at the end of the day, believing these things would be essential to the Christian faith because they're biblical and they're ancient truths. <laughs> I think you put that fantastically. Father, anything to add on why why Mary, understanding who she is, as you explain in this book, why that is so important to the life of the Christian? Well, as William mentioned, the Proto-Evangelium, Genesis 3.15, we're told that a woman's seed uh, is going to crush the head of the serpent, Satan. And uh, we know that this woman's seed is fulfilled in Jesus. But what we also learn is the next time that the Bible quite clearly quotes that phraseology, the only other time, is in the book of Revelation. And what we find out is a woman who has her own seed, which is fighting and crushing in the final battle, the serpent Satan, also is named as the mother of all those who are the allies or the brethren of the Savior. And so uh, the Bible uh, takes Mary and has us um, go full circle where the prediction of a mother of a Savior is, is already in Genesis in the fall of the garden, and that in the typological victory, beginning with the death, the, the, actually the, the birth, uh, and then the passion, uh, death, and resurrection of Christ, in anticipation of the second coming, uh, always has Mary there in some way pointing to Christ and the history of salvation, this kind of giant circle uh, from 
a woman who disobeyed to a woman who obeyed, uh, from a woman who uh, is the foreshadowing of a better woman who will have a perfect seed, uh, to this woman who, when she has a perfect seed, uh, it's extended, uh, that is the entire family uh, of Christ can be adopted into her as the mother. And so that's really what the scripture is from Genesis to Revelation is Jesus and Mary together. And provided that you see that the scripture is organized in this way, uh, then you see that there's no competition between the two because that's just the way the Holy Spirit wrote it. <laughs> that's a fantastic way of putting that. What a great summary. I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, to both of you, I want to say an enormous thank you for being here on the show, for writing this fantastic book. The book is the definitive guide for solving biblical questions about Mary, Mary Among the Evangelists. It's available uh, on Amazon where you find fine books like this one. And it's getting great reviews, as you've mentioned. I, I think it's is fantastic. William, where else do you want to point people to go to find out things that uh, that you're up to? And then, Father, I'll give you a chance as well afterwards. Where can they go to find more about William Albrecht? Yeah, that's incredible that you asked that because you can go to my webpage and my website, www.patristicpillars.com, and you can check out my blog. And my blog, pretty much every project that I work on with Father is posted there, including things I do on my own. I, I've got a ton of stuff there. People can check out debates that I've done, and people can check me out on Twitter as well as well as on Facebook. And we'd also like to tell you all that very soon, hopefully by Christmas, if you're thinking about stocking stuffers or maybe some gifts under the, under the tree, we should have a brand new book out, The Secret History of Transubstantiation, Pulling Back, Pulling Back the Veil on the Eucharist, another book that we have been hard at work on, should be coming out soon. So, you know, keep keep your eyes peeled there and, you know, follow me on my webpage. And right now you'll find out where you can find out uh, where you can follow Father stuff, which I highly recommend. He's got a ton of incredible reading material as well. But um, for me, you can go there, check out the stuff we've got there. We've got a lot of really good stuff going on. And really, at the end of the day, we what we hope is, is one thing, uh, Keith. We hope people are being edified by this stuff. We hope people recognize that the truth in the faith is a beautiful truth, and it is a truth that has not changed, it will never change, and will be, will be everlasting, my friend. <laughs> Amen. Father, I know that you're busy teaching. Uh, where else can people go to uh, read more of the things that you've written or you're up to? Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, the best place is Amazon.com, which has both my scholarly materials as well as my popular books. As William says, we're really excited about the next popular book that comes out that's going to be in as best as we can do it, the same style as the Marian book, and that is on transubstantiation, and it's going to be doing a lot of the same things that you yourself, Keith, have gotten used to, which is seeing typological fulfillments on the Eucharist and how the early church takes those and how we get from uh, the Old Testament to the New Testament on the Eucharist uh, all the images that are used and how Saint, all these saints, whether Greek-speaking or Syriac or Coptic, all the way up to Thomas Aquinas, maintain the same metaphors and images and vocabulary for the definition of transubstantiation. So it's going to be m much along the same lines of, of what you've already become accustomed to. So that's the thing we're most excited about. Um, I'm certainly excited to receive anyone who wants to study with me at St. Cyril and Methodius Byzantine Catholic Seminary. Uh, where we do offer an online master's program. Uh, but other than that, you can also check out my free uh, scholarly materials and popular materials on my academia.edu website and just search my name there. That's fantastic. And I'll put links in the show notes to all these different things. And definitely looking forward to that book. I'll have you both back on the show if I can when that comes out. And I'll definitely, as you suggest, William, stuff that book in my stocking as, as soon as it comes out. <laughs> that sounds definitely. fantastic. Thank you to both of you for being on the show. Thank you for the work that both of you do for the Church Father, for your priesthood, of course, and for the contributions that you guys both are giving to enriching and increasing uh, knowledge of, of these things uh, in the church. Thank you so much, and God bless both of you, and thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Awesome. Take care.
Thank you once again for listening to The Cordial Catholic. Hope you loved that conversation. I think it was a fantastic one. Check out the show notes in your podcatching app for links to William's stuff, to Father Christian Kappas' stuff, and to their book and their forthcoming books as well. It's fantastic stuff there, guys. TheCordialCatholic.com is my website for show notes and for my blog. At Cordial Catholic on Twitter, The Cordial Catholic on Facebook, and please send your feedback to CordialCatholic at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys and write back to everyone I can as soon as I can. We're on Instagram as well at Cordial Catholic for the few followers who are following us there. Have a look and do follow me there as well. Patreon.com slash Cordial Catholic is the website to support this show. Even a buck or two a month goes a long way into helping this show to keep going, and $5 or more a month donors go into an automatic draw for free books every single month. As my way of saying thank you. PayPal.me slash Cordial Catholic for one-time donations. Please do subscribe to this podcast, follow it wherever you find it, please tell a friend, please leave a rating or a review if you can, that helps to push the podcast out to new people and fulfill the mission of evangelization, which kind of underpins this whole thing. Thanks for listening, friends. Please do know that I am praying for you. Please pray for me too. And of course, I'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for listening, guys. And as always, God bless. Take care.